what since the second half really how much they've really struggled charged with finding some stability from this welcome back to the next episode of the journey of a grassroots rugby coach and today's guest is charles dudley charles is a rugby coach but he's also an snc coach at nudgy college in brisbane where he works across several sports Charles is also currently completing his PhD through Nudgee College and ACU. Since recording this episode, Charles has been appointed the SNC coach for the Queensland Reds Super W team. During our chat, we spoke about how the SNC coach and the co rugby coach can work together with technical and technical aspects of their coaching. How grassroots coaches can get rid of their conditioning blocks and make training more intense. Also, we discussed setting decision-making activities in training and finding what is your player's motivation. We discussed about being responsible for your own development and choosing your mentors wisely, but also not being afraid to take risks. I really hope you enjoy this chat and hopefully you can get some takeaways with regards to the SNC space and grassroots coaching. It was a great chat talking to Charles about how we can uh, use SNC with grassroots coaches when you may possibly be the only coach there at a junior team. So get your pens and papers out, take some notes. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast, give us a review. That's how we get out there to more people. And as always, if you feel that you know a coach that can benefit from listening to this podcast, share it, pass it on to anyone that you think can find any snippet of information in this. It's all about learning and sharing the knowledge. My first bit of advice would be to choose your mentors wisely. Um, and, and, and this would be, I think when you have a good mentor, your, your development, and, and this comes back to you get more experience. Your development is accelerated better than, than anything else. And at the same point in time, when you have a bad mentor, you can actually learn a fair bit more about yourself and about... Um, coaching but it does take you a long time to realize that they're potentially um barking up the wrong tree and i think more and more with people having access to social media and there being no filters and things like that occasionally people can get um uh, bamboozled by people with seemingly great experience and they're potentially not the best mentor um, and can get sidetracked by that sort of stuff. But when you do have a mentor that is um, going to push you, they're going to challenge you, they're going to teach you, they're invested in your development, I think that personally for me as a coach, when I'm in those scenarios, there's nowhere else I'd rather be because I know I'm getting better. Um, so to try and put myself in those situations. Um, and he can't find it. That's a mighty shot. A mighty Mark Lester. All right, mate. So um, let's try that again. Yeah. All right. So we'll make a start. Um, thanks for your time, Charles. Um, just for the people that are listening that won't know who you are, just in a nutshell, um, the Charles Dudley story. Who are you? Where are you? And what's your involvement with grassroots sport? Yeah, so I'm a uh, SNC at Nudgee College up in Queensland right now. Um, background across all sports, mainly rugby, weightlifting, um, worked with ice hockey in China for a little bit. Um, and as both sort of an SNC coach and a rugby coach. So um, I sort of, you know, started off doing a fair bit of SNC, studied it at uni. Um, I'm still at uni. Um, and then also at the same time, um, just began coaching. I got asked by my old coach to go back to my school and some advice I got when I was young was just coach everything. If you want to be a coach, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a back squat or a, or a pass, you just coach whatever you can. So I said, yep, no worries. And actually probably for my first few years of coaching, ended up coaching more footy than I did SNC. Um, but now I've sort of gone, gone pretty heavily down that SNC path and um, not coaching so much the tactical side of the sport anymore, but obviously still, still pretty involved with rugby as much as I can be, yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's good, and that and that's where I know you from is um, your time down here at Melbourne with uh, some of the rebels. I think it was the under thirteens and stuff like that. So quite a few yeah. years ago, before you made the move to sunny, I think you went to China from here and then to Queensland. Is that correct? Yeah, so I did the rebels programs. I did 
under 13s twice, some youth uh, female sevens, and then some academy for a period of time. Um, and then after that, it was over to China for about six months. Um, and then it was into a Melbourne lockdown for about eight, nine months. And then up to sunny Queensland. So nice. um, escaped, escaped the most recent lockdown, but, but caught the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, that's good, mate. So some of these uh, questions, I'll try and reword them a little bit for you, mate. Um, yeah, for sure. So with, with your coach, like, you, like you said, you do a lot of coaching in, in a lot of different sports. Mm. Have you had any heartbreaks or disappointments across those sports that you can, because as, co- as coaches, we all have them. Mm. Um, and it's just, I think it's good to let young coaches or inexperienced coaches know that no matter at what level you're at, you have, you know, your disappointments and, and just how, how we overcome them is, is the way we move forward. So, Yeah, 100%. I was, I was thinking about this one. I sort of, I have a bit of a philosophy. It's like you either win or you learn. Um, and so that's something that I try to live by when it comes to sort of on-field results. Like, yeah, there have been games where I've been, I've been filthy for weeks and my partner will tell you I come home and she, she knows when we've lost a game we shouldn't have lost. Um, like, it's just, it, it, it does hit you something different. But those are, those are the ones where you, you, you really can learn from them. Um, I, was, I was sort of reflecting a bit. I think the biggest disappointment was, was when my, my process was out and... Um, it was when I was down in Melbourne and a club who will remain nameless um, asked me to come and come and coach for them for the preseason, basically run their, run their preseason program for some of their age grades. And um, they, they basically came and they said, we just want you as an S&C, um, try and make it rugby specific S&C. And I went, OK, all right. And I got there and, mate, the kids just wanted to play touch. <laughs> like, they didn't yeah. want S&C. They, they weren't interested in a performance program. They just wanted to hang out with their mates and play touch. And if I, mate, if I tried to get their heart rate above 120 beats per minute, they weren't having any of it. And I, I, I got so wound up and so frustrated by it. And I was like, how, how do I actually build a relationship with these kids? How do I build buy-in? How do I do? I was being paid. Um, which for a rugby coach in Victoria is pretty rare, but I was being paid mm-hmm. fairly well. Um, and I just, I, honestly, that, that whole program, I just don't think the club got out of it what they wanted. I don't think the kids got what they needed. I don't think that I got um, what I wanted to be as a coach out of it. And I'd say so, like, that was my biggest disappointment because it wasn't, there was no on-field result. I didn't coach them throughout the season, but I'd been asked to do a role and it, it, it just... It, the whole thing was just wasn't an enjoyable experience um and that's probably where I, I reflect and that's probably my worst time in coaching um to some respect because it, it just it, it wasn't what I want to be as a coach yeah that's some good reflection mate around that and it's probably difficult um and, and different in that role that you do around that S&C stuff because sometimes you don't actually have that freedom that you have as as the team coach because mm. i'm going to go to you and go i want them to do this or be able to do that and then that might not align with what you want to bring to the team yes yeah, so that's 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 really good um some good insight there for coaches and even assistant coaches you still got to you know you're sitting underneath that the, the head coach or the director of rugby or whoever's running that program so yeah that's yeah, and it's an interesting one, mate. And that sort of probably talks to how SNCs and head coaches interact. I was actually, I was, I was running the show there. Um, so it was um, really just me, but it was still sort of, it was just different, um, different expectations from different parties. The kids wanted to come up and play touch. I thought I was coming in to run a, a performance-based program where we were trying to get them better and improve their yo-yo time or whatever it's going to be. And the parents thought it was going to be a, a professionally run s and And it did just the, yeah, the, the difference in terms of expectations, what caused the issues there. But you sort of, you touch on, an, on, on a broader point in terms of um, why do s and and tactical technical coaches have different goals? Because... I've always tried to position myself as someone that can, you know, I, I started coaching rugby and I, I you know, I, I loved it. I thought it was great for my development as an SNC because if you're not affecting the scoreboard, you're not doing your job. 
And as an SNC, that's true. As a tactical coach, that's true. And more and more, they're becoming integrated to a point where I don't believe you can be, be a good SNC um, without having a really good understanding of the tactical and technical outcomes that the coaches are trying to achieve. Because your job is not to just be there in that four minute block where you're going to run your Euro fits for four minutes. Your job is to help athletes to be physically prepared to play the game style and the game that the coach wants to implement. If the coach can't employ the tactical and technical um, model that they want to employ because physical there's physical deficits, you haven't done your job. And that's going to extend beyond a four minute block and maybe half an hour of weights at the start. It's going to go, hey, can we make this drill a little bit bigger? Can we shorten this drill there? This was meant to be an intense drill and you ended up talking for seven minutes out of the eight minute block and things like that. And I think when the SNC and the tactical coaches can combine and really perform a, a form a, a really cohesive unit, that's when you get the best of those tactical, technical and, and, and physical outcomes. Yeah, and that's really good, mate. Um, and it's a good point for coaches to remember because up until I sort of got into that, rebels age group stuff i was the only coach at the club like or the team so i was doing the snc and i was doing this and i was doing that and all of a sudden you get put in this environment where you've actually got an snc guy that a he knows what he's talking about and you're trying to go i want to be able to do this and you know you guys speak a different language than what we speak and you know, just haven't been able to have, like you said, that communication between this, how do we, this is the goal we want to achieve. How do we get there both tactically and through that SNC component? Um, and that's something that I've really had to, um, that I've learned over the last couple of years being in those programs where you've actually got specific people that, you know, from, would run a far better program than what I've ever done because I'm not an SNC guy. Um, but then I've also come across S and C guys that are just, you know, about the stats, and they, they don't have, like you said, they don't have that little bit of tactical technical knowledge. Um, and how do we incorporate different things as we go? So, yeah, building those relationships between the, the S and C guy and the and the coaches is is really important if, if you've got the luxury to have one. So now that's that's a good reflection, mate. I really. Know. Yeah, and like at a, at a grassroots level, you are going to be the only person on the field a lot of the time, or you might have, you know, a, an attack coach and a defense coach. So it's kind of incumbent on grassroots coaches to understand like how to do that. Like when I coach at a grassroots level, I wholly believe that you, do, you don't need to do conditioning for grassroots level athletes. You don't need to do a conditioning block. You should be able to get the conditioning outcomes that you need from small sided games. Um, and if you don't, and if you can't, then it means that your, your design of small sided games is flawed. And I think that it's almost, you know, the, the, the best grassroots coaches can understand um, how, to, how to begin to do that because you're not going to have that support around you and that expertise around you. And just going right for the last 20 minutes of training, we're going to flog them with coat hangers or Broncos or Malcolms or whatever is like, it, it is, it, it, it's flawed. Um, it, it's, yeah. it's just, it's, it's not the best way to do it. And if you're trying to implement best practice, that's, that's not it. Mm. Yeah, no, and that's a good point, mate. Like those those high intensity games, where they're probably actually doing more work in that last twenty minutes if they're playing that high intensity over like six v four or whatever the situation is, they're probably actually going to get more out of that than like you said doing coat hangers or yo yos or whatever because they're just going to go, oh shit, here we go again, and they uh, at grassroots level half of them. Are you've lost them by then they've switched off. Yeah. And it's what, what, what are you not getting from the small sided games? Mm. And that's, that's what you can supplement with conditioning. So you might not yeah. get an absolute max balls to the wall sprint. You might not get that. Yeah. So you might need to do that. You might not get a lot of um, higher speed running, which you might think is important. So you might have to do that somewhere else. But we know when we put GPS units on athletes that, you know, from a four on four off sided touch, um, with a, a, a 30 meter width on the field, we can get um, running meters that are far and above what we're going to get in a game. 
So why isn't that a good enough conditioning drill for the most of our training? Yes, we're going to have to supplement these things here and there, but if we're training above game intensity for short periods of time, isn't that going to be better than boring a bunch of 15-year-olds with uh, Malcolm's for 20 minutes? Like, I know I know, as a 15-year-old, which one I would rather do, you know? Oh, mate, exactly. As a 15-year-old, you'd play like those games for two or three hours and not think about it. But if someone asked you to, you know, to do a, back in my day, they were 440s and all that, you'd just go, oh, I'm not doing that. Well, you just ran like 5Ks, mate, because yeah. you're actually enjoying it, yeah. And that's a really good point for, like you said, at that grassroots level. Um, obviously, it changes as you, as you progress through, but you know, that, that's that's good, mate. Um, what about some of the great moments you've had coaching? Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, this isn't so much as a coach because, again, like, like um, I mean, again, we've won games that we weren't meant to win and, you know, you've made a change and you've just gone, I've got you, sucker, in a line <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, and you have a little bit of a grin to yourself. Um, and, and those are great. Like, like, they're so much fun when you have a chuckle to yourself. Um, but I mean, I, 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 my, my greatest moment, I come back to this, this is my greatest moment in coaching, rugby, whatever it is, when where I was um, first 15 coach and running a program down in Melbourne at a school. And um, it was a small program. We weren't awfully competitive in rugby, but I, I felt that we built a really great culture. Um, and that was probably best personified by this bloke who had just rocked up to the school. He played one game and he had a bit of a, a tragedy happen in his family where a tree went through his rental property and it, it was uninhabitable and insurance weren't paying out and he basically had nowhere to live and him and his family weren't um, flush with cash um, and within 24 hours the rugby fraternity had raised enough money and this was kids coming up pulling you know 20 cent coins out of their wallet and things like that mm -hmm. and getting them into a hotel for a night so they could just sort of um, you know um, recompose themselves and come together and, and sort out what they were going to do next and for me as a coach to have been you know I was in that program for a long time and that was in my last season when I was there and I was like I'm comfortable leaving this place now because I know the culture is great I know that that's that's everything that people talk about what's great about sport what's great about rugby um and so that for me is probably the moment that I'm proudest of as a coach is it, it's just that I helped to be in an environment where those sorts of actions take place. Yeah, that's that's powerful, mate. That's that's awesome for the like you said for the kids just to to get involved and, and to do that. So yeah, that's a that's a pretty good uh, culture you've set up there, mate. That's um yeah yeah, and you're right about you do sometimes in the games you do something or you win that game you're not supposed to win, but yeah. Yeah, mate, I, I, I'll, I'll give you a rugby one. I'll buy it. There was one where we had a call. It was This was when I was coaching the under-13s, and it was a call on the line-out. And we basically just, it was a, um, we didn't jump on the call. And we had to train the hookers not to balk and all that sort of stuff. And it was just um, really aggressive. We just went three, two, one up. We kept it super simple. And the caller three, two, one up and the opposition went up and they held him there for maybe 25 seconds and then put him down and we took the ball. And that was, that's probably one where I just had the best chuckle to myself where you went, hey, we trained that, it came off in the game. And especially with under 13 kids, they just love it. They, they have such just unbridled joy for the sport. You can see them all um, enjoying it as well. Maybe not, the, uh, maybe not the opposition so much, but that was probably one where I had a good laugh to myself. Yeah, and those kids will remember that long before long after you've forgotten all about it so that yeah <laughs> they're those moments that they remember yeah, yeah no, that's good mate um we've probably we've probably touched on this one a, a bit already but what are some of the lessons you've learned um either from you know your snc stuff or your rugby stuff that you could pass on to to new coaches around um you know, coach and actually it'd be good like in the SNC space, just to give some like you said, knowledge to the the grassroots coach that, you know, he's coaching because his kid plays or he was too slow to move back when they're handing the, the whistle out. You know, that that we all know those coaches that get um, thrown in at thrown in the deep end and then they get overwhelmed with everything. So what's some of the 
the lessons you've learned during your time that you could pass on to those coaches around S and C stuff at at that you know that grassroots level um, that that we haven't covered already. Yeah, I think a, a few of the core principles. I I think. Um, Get rid of the fitness block in your training. Just get rid of it. You don't need it. The kids don't enjoy it. Learn to make training hard in other ways. Um, and if you do, and, and honestly, I, I think, and we've all been there, mate, the coaches in the car on the way there going, what am I going to do with these kids? And putting a fitness block in is a good way to get time in and then the kids are working and everyone's happy and the parents are happy because they're tired when they go home, they just go to bed. And, um, but if you're going to have that fitness block, make it a speed block, don't make it a conditioning block. Because, again, speed something you're not going to get from your small, small-sided small games. So trying to work speed elements in there. And, again, make them fun. Make them flags games. Make them races, things like that. Um, and then the other one, just from a purely S&C perspective, and this is honestly, mate, this is from an S&C perspective and as a rugby coach, put away your 25 different starter plays for your under-14s team that they're not going to do in a game when they can't pass and catch five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I know, right? <laughs> oh, I see it now. Like you go around and like, when you're doing stuff with the 16s, that a lot. I'll, I'll often just go out and watch junior footy. Mm. And you just stand there, and you just go. You see them warming up, and you just go, "What the hell are you trying to do?" And the kids, the kids don't even enjoy it because no. yeah, they don't enjoy it. You're running, st- you're running launches against guys. You don't have any opposition in there. You're not doing. What are they going to do after that That phase is done? It, it's got no relevance again. Like going back, what relevance is that to the techni- tactical and technical model that you're trying to employ? Yeah. You, you spend, like if you look at every minute of training, you want to spend it in the most efficient way possible. You want to be doing the thing that's going to affect the scoreboard. Starter plays aren't that. The winger that, you know, he, he's wicked fast, but he gets to under 16 levels. He gets to you guys. And he's never actually passed the ball because all you do is plays where he just stands on the edge, catches it, and then scores against no one. And and we're going, mate, why can't he pass left to right? Why can't he do any of this? Well, because he's never done it, mate. Why? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right. And I remember talking to, and I can't remember who it was I was talking to, and he was coaching at, uh, it wasn't at a rep level, but it was sort of that top level age area before they go into the rep stage and he said and he had a winger who got into a two-on-one with so he had the winger and the fullback looped round against the opposition fullback and he didn't know what to do Mm. because he'd never like I said he'd always just ran against nobody so he just I think he ended up just throwing like took it into contact or and he goes yeah that's when he just went yeah these these things that we're doing don't but he said running against ghosts and not having that yeah. And that's where that's where decision making and putting athletes in environments where they're um where, where they're exposed to a variety of different um sort of in rugby we use the term pictures a lot. Give them a different mm-hmm. picture, give them a different picture. So when, when you're exposing young athletes to a variety of different pictures, and that's going to come through, yes, you need to train the contact element and things like that, obviously, and you can work that into games, but that's going to come through things like touch games and um, all, 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 all sorts of different stuff where you're continuously presenting them with different pictures. So then they begin to understand, right, I might not have been in this exact situation before, but I've been in something similar to it about a thousand times. So I know what's going to have a positive outcome here. Um, and, and you've got to put them in that situation a thousand times before. Um, and there's a good there's a good example in, in soccer is probably the best one from it where People talk about left-footed players are a bit more mercurial. They can seem to dance around other players a bit better than everyone else. But there's nothing actually special about being left-footed. The thing that's special about being left-footed is that your defenders haven't seen that picture as often as they've seen someone that dribbles with their right foot. So they're used to how right-footed players move. They're used to um, picking up those those cues from those right-footed players and being able to anticipate what they're going to do. And it's the same sort of thing where in rugby, if you haven't given, if you can give the opposition a picture they haven't seen before, they're going to make a mistake. 
So when you're training your team, you need to give them as many different pictures as possible. So when they come up against a picture that is that left-footed player in soccer, they can adapt and they can overcome it and they can they can win the situation. Yeah, no, that's exactly right, mate. And you even see it at the international level. You know, a couple of years, it was when Italy played England that year and they didn't compete at the breakdown and they just mm. come around. England didn't know what to do because they'd never seen it before. You know, um, yeah, so that, that happens at all levels. So, yeah, the more exposure you can give to to players in that, yeah, different different pitches for the opposition is is way better. Like you said, they might not, not be exactly the same, but they're, it's very similar to what they've... At least they know, well, if this this happens that, I can go that way, or, you know, they've got a bit of understanding around it now. So that, that's really good, mate, like that. Um so had even with your essence actually with probably more towards your s c stuff mm. um how do you keep your trainings enjoy how do you keep that in training environment enjoyable um whilst also being able to have um so you might have like an aspiring athlete and uh, a beginner athlete in the same session how do you keep those sessions enjoyable for both athletes, whether, but they both get something out of it. Mm. Does, does that make sense what I'm trying to trying to get at? Yeah, it does, mate. And it's, it's sort of the hardest thing in coaching, isn't it? When you've got, especially yeah. at the grassroots level, mate, you've got one kid who's, you know, maybe he's, maybe you're at a club with only one team. They don't have a second. They don't have a third. You've got one bloke who's just coming across from AFL. He goes, I love rugby or I, I want to try rugby. And as a coach, you go, mate, 100%, this is the greatest sport on earth. I want you to have a great time. Like you so say, you want to try and cater training towards them, but at the same point in time, you've got a bloke that's playing for academy level. You're trying to, you know, I'm trying to coach him. So when he goes to you guys at the rep level, that he, he's got the skills and things like that. Um, I think what it comes down to is knowing knowing what each person's motivation is for coming to training and, and then showing them that not all of training is going to be about necessarily having um fun per se like i think i think this like idea of enjoyment at a grassroots level is sometimes mis uh, uh, misapplied to people you know oh we're just going to play touch for an hour well kids actually enjoy challenge uh, everyone enjoys challenge they enjoy being motivated they enjoy being pushed there's a reason that they're coming there and they're not just sitting at home watching um TV or, or, or doing something else. They don't have to be there. Um, there's no financial motivation at a grassroots level. So it's finding what's motivating them and then pushing that and really re-emphasizing that, being um, aware of your communication to them in terms of are you emphasizing how what you are doing is relevant to how they are motivated? Um, so if it is just someone that wants to come and, uh, and play with his mates and things like that, that's fine. But he could be doing that somewhere else. He's chosen to come to you. He's chosen to play the sport. And people are inherently competitive. Um, they, 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 like, they don't like losing. They don't like being bad at things. So even the kids that um, on the surface look like they, they don't want to be there, they're not engaged, all that's happening is that you haven't found what's motivating them at that point in time. And that's what you need to do. Because as soon as they find that motivation, as soon as they find that something to strive for, they're going to enjoy training. Like it, it is going to be fun. All that's happening right now is you haven't found that as a coach. And so you need to, that's when you need to be having those conversations before and after training and things like that to really understand why are you here? Why are you not at a skate park? Why are you not watching TV, playing PlayStation? Yeah, and that's that's a really good point, mate. And I've had a few coaches mention that having that finding what that motivation is, um, and tapping into that for each each player. Um, but yeah, you're right. They've chosen to come. Why why have they come to you and not the club down the road or yeah, sat at home or, or whatever? So yeah, find out why what their motivation is. To yeah, and it, and it comes down to mate, like like I, I I've. You know, I, I spoke before about how don't do conditioning work and stuff like that. Some of the best workouts kids have is where you get, like, where you put them through a conditioning block and there's big noise and everyone's getting around each other and they're hurting and 
my, for me as an athlete, maybe not for the fronties, but for, for me, that was some of the stuff I remember as being some of the best stuff where you're really working hard, where you've got that um, everyone's got the one goal. They're working together as a team. There's that, um, you know, you're suffering together as a team. Like that's, that, that's stuff that um, motivates kids. That's stuff that, it, that they do enjoy um, a lot of the time. Um, and I don't think to purely say, hey, training has to be fun. Let's just play games for an hour. I don't think that's actually fun for anyone. No. no. And, and you're right. Like you see the kids, um, you know, the kid might be unfit or whatever, especially like the unfit ones. And you're doing a, just a step, you know, um, suicides or something. And everyone else is finished and they turn around, this kid's struggling. So they all turn around and they go back and they get this kid. And you just see that kid, he just, he just lifts and just like, yeah, I've, I've found where I belong. Because these guys actually, they don't care that I'm not, un- they don't care that I'm unfit. They actually just care about me as a person. And that, that's, that's really re- rewarding for, for young players as well, I think, that they found somewhere they can belong and be themselves. 100%, mate. People, people are not, we're not um, like uh, solo beasts. We want to be part of a team. We mm. want to be part of a community. And how do you build that team? How do you build that community? Because that's what's going to be enjoyable when you have that team, when you have that community, when everyone's working towards a common goal. It's not, yeah, fluffing around. It's it, If you have a team that is that really shows that, everyone's going to be enjoying it. It's not about, hey, what's a fun drill? What's a not fun drill? Because that, that, that's just a, a construct that sometimes we can create and like, in our head there's no such thing as a fun drill and a not fun drill like if i want to have fun i'm going to go to luna park or something like that like yeah people go to rugby for different yeah the the motivations are different and and largely it is especially at the grassroots level where's your tribe where's your team where are your brothers where are your sisters yeah and that and that's what you're looking for and if you build that enjoyment comes second like enjoyment is sort of not something that they're, they're even really thinking about because they're there with their family yeah no good point and that that reminds me of a, a team i coached where one of the guys got knocked out and um ended up getting taken to hospital and none of the boys went to the after match function of course they all went to the hospital and i went yeah you guys are excused like if that's where you're going to be with your brother and, you know, like they all went and I just went, that, that's more important than anything else that, you know, so, and yeah, like you said, they've just, they found their people, found their tribe. Yeah, 100%, mate, 100%. Yeah. No, I love it, love it. That's why we love the game, mate. Um, when you give feedback to your athletes, because um, there's heaps of ways you can give feedback, um, what, a, what method do you use? Um with regards to feedback, um, both positive and the, the big, the, the one that everyone struggles with is that negative feedback to a player the or an athlete. Yeah. I mean, mate, mate, I'd, I'd love to sit here and spurt out like, you know, a textbook definition and pretend oh. like I've never absolutely lost my raggedy bloke who's done the dumbest thing I've seen in my life. But we're all human, and uh, I, I. And again, like I don't always think that that super emotional side of thing is always a bad thing. If it's your go-to every time to just yell and scream, it's not great. But it's it, it's it's knowing when to use it. Um, and so, broadly speaking, my my approach towards feedback is one to know the athlete and to know what they're going to respond to. And two, and probably the overarching one that builds back into number one is what response are you trying to elicit mm. and what's the best way to get there? Because we don't communicate for no reason. We communicate yeah. because we want to see a change in behaviour. Yeah. And if the way you're communicating is not going to elicit that change in behaviour, well, you might as well talk to yourself because there's no actual point in what you're doing. Um, and so, and, and that really is going to be athlete dependent. For example, like when I coach weightlifters, is sometimes you can just, you can make an arm action and that can be a communication because you want a technical change in them. And they go, you know, th- th- they look at you, you go like this and they go, they nod, they know exactly what you mean. That's how you communicate with them. You don't need to 
go into a four minute discussion on the technical model of what you're trying mm. to achieve. The same with rugby players. Sometimes you can, if you're coaching a line out, you can just give them a hand action and they go, give them a leg action and they know, right, oh, you know, I didn't bend at my knees. I was, I was bending at my back and you don't need to, that's communication. You know, body language is communication. At the same point in time, sometimes, yeah, you do need to give verbal feedback and it's been said over and over, but like the feedback sandwich is a good one. Tell them what they did well, or give them an overall positive praise, tell them what they did well, tell them what they could improve. Um, there's, there's a million different strategies in terms of how you can actually get people or, or how you can give feedback. But I think the overarching one is be deliberate with your communication because you are trying to elicit a response. And if your communication isn't eliciting that response, you need to change your communication strategy. Yeah. And I think to, like you said, once you know your players and even with the negative feedback or the constructive criticism, whatever the buzzword is at the moment, if the players know it's coming from a good place, um, they tend to be, most players tend to be more receptive of it. Like mm. I'm telling you this cause I want you to get better. Um, you know, yes. I'm, and some players don't respond unless you give them a ball again. Mm. you know and there's other guys you've got to you know put your arm around them and 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 just talk to them and but yeah knowing knowing the players and and having it come from a a good place i think is you know yeah it's a pretty shitty situation of it to be in and i hate having to do it um and we've all had to do it at some point and it's probably the worst part of coaching um but i think if you give it to them with the best intentions for the player um, I, I found that works for me best. Um, but yeah, like you said, just just knowing them and making sure they understand it as well. Yeah, understand it. You also have to you have to understand everything is communication. So so when I say, are you trying to? You have to communicate to try and elicit a response. If I'm going to, you know, raise the volume of my voice, change the tone to be more aggressive. I'm going to increase the arousal of the players. If I'm then telling them that they're doing a really fine technical thing wrong, well, that's not what we want. Mm. If it is, if it is an effort thing, then it, you know, I, I I don't think coaches can say there's no effort out there. What, what actually is effort? I don't think anyone's actually out on the field not putting it in. So not putting effort in. So how are you going to elicit that change in behavior? How are you going to change what's perceived to be as effort? Mm. Um, and if it is purely that they're not working hard enough, then maybe that increased arousal, maybe giving them a bollocking is correct. Um, I think generally with the negative stuff, um, it, 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 it's sometimes, sometimes it's got to come from a coach. Again, knowing your players, knowing who your leaders are, but it's also really good if it can come from your leaders because mm. players aren't dumb. Players know more about the game. Players, it, it, when they come into the halftime huddle, if you've got reasonably well-experienced players, they'll probably know more about how the game is going or, or what the feel is than, than, than you do. Okay, generally yeah. speaking, I find that you'll learn more than players and they'll learn from you. And when they, they come in at halftime, ask them, guys, this is what I can see. Why is it happening? What can we do to fix it? You know, and, and they'll give you the right answer nine times out of 10 if you yeah. actually ask that. They never, they never come out and go, oh, yeah, our defense is bad because of some ridiculous reason. They're, they're right most of the time. Yeah, that's right. And they're, they're the guys that are in that in there doing it so they know that what it, what's going on out there because there could be stuff happening out there that you don't see as well um for whatever for whatever reason again know. mate especially at the grassroots level you're oh. down there you don't have 42 different performance analysts telling yeah. you how, how far everyone's you're, you're just trying to watch footy and yeah and and i don't know, know about you but like at the grassroots level, you try to watch the footy and you've got the reserves talking to you and you've got the manager talking to you and you've got some yobbo in the, in the crowd mm -hmm. trying to... And you just go, man, I'm just trying to do fight. And then all of a sudden, why are you dealing with that? Something happens there and you just go, you know, yeah. So that's get that feedback from the players as well. Uh, that's, that's really good, mate. I like it. Um, coach development. Um, mm. What are your... What's some of the stuff you've done around developing yourself 
um, as a coach, mm. and whether that's in the S and C role or in the rugby role. Um, I, and I don't know what the S and C side of it's like, um, but I know for a long time in Australian rugby, we had coach education, but not necessarily coach development. And it has, I will say, it has changed in the last four or five years. But you know, you used to go and you do your courses, and then that was sort of you're left on your own. Um, but it has changed a bit now. So what's some of the advice you could give around development of coaches, uh, whether in the S&C space or in the, the rugby space or any other sports that you're involved in? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm from, from an S&C perspective, I think it is really important, first of all, to have a, a good knowledge of what you're actually teaching. I think people can get a little bit, airy fairy with okay well you just need to communicate well and you just need the people to love you and that's true and you do need all those things but if you don't know the nuts and bolts you're gonna get found out to be a fraud at some point like you so you so i do think that there does need to be a bit of understanding of those nuts and bolts and i'm probably a little bit biased i'm at a point where i'm doing in the middle of doing my phd so i'm someone that quite enjoys that um that learning side of things um but I do think that one of the issues is that I think that there's a lack of accountability in terms of who's responsible for everything. You know, you get coaches out there saying, oh, there's no coach, there's no coach development in this country. I just did my level two and I was left to my own. Mate, go out and find it. Like if you want to be a good coach, just go out and find it. I don't actually think it's up to a governing body to necessarily um, provide a, a, a crazily large amount of coach development. Yes, getting access to that next level of coach is great, <laughs> but if you're a club that wants to attract coaches that are high quality and can potentially, if, if I was if I was running a club, I would want a coach to come to me and say, Charles, I want to coach at a professional level. I want to be here. I want you to help me to do that. I want to become the best I can. I'll give everything to this club. You probably get a few years of me as, an, as a good coach, but I want you to keep pushing me. And I think that there is some sort of, um, you know, the, the club should be investing in that potentially more than the governing body is because the governing body we know, especially in rugby, doesn't have the resources to do that. And they, mm. they just don't. And if you keep crying out for someone that doesn't have the resources to do it, well, they can't change anything. They, they, they can't necessarily say, okay, great, we're going to put on courses every weekend and pay all these people to come and stuff like that. You have to, you have to go out and find it yourself and you have to be motivated to do that. Um, yeah, and that's basically like, I, like I, I think that if you put more, if, if clubs and schools and um, different organisations took a bit more responsibility for developing the people that are in charge of delivering their product, which is rugby, I, th I think we'd be in a bit of a better place, whereas it sort of seems to be a bit of a everyone pointing at everyone else and no one actually saying like, hey, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to step up and I'm going to look at how I can develop our coaches. So a good example is at the school right now, we were looking, the director of rugby is running a conference um, and the theme of it is that co-opetition, we're going to bring all these different people that are competing. We're going to come together. They've got some headline speakers. And he's just decided to run that because he's gone, this is going to be a great development opportunity for our coaches. This is going to be a great development opportunity for other coaches within our competition, which is going to strengthen our competition, which is going to strengthen our players. And instead of whinging and moaning that other people aren't doing this, we're just going to do it ourselves. And I think that if more people took that, um, took that approach to, to building the game, we'd be in a better place. Yeah, that's a really good point, mate. And I think, too, with all the stuff that's come out of these lockdowns and COVID and all that, what it's actually highlighted to me was the actual accessibility that you get to people. Like, I'm in all these WhatsApp groups and Facebook chats with coaches from all around the world. And it's just I've sent them a message or, you know, an email and... and you know, if you send out 100 emails, you might get 80 responses for people who go, yeah, mate, I'm free to have a chat. Um, but I think as young coaches, and I know I was like this as a young coach, you feel that little bit intimidated about, about doing that. But like you said, once you go out and you ask people, most of them will either 
help you. And if they can't, they'll put you, you know, I'll go and see Charles and tell him I, I told you to give you, give you a call, you know, so they're, they're trying to connect people. And like you said, to make that, um, that development more accessible, I think, than what it has been um, over the last 10 years. And I suppose too, with the internet and all that, that stuff too, it's getting a lot, a lot easier to connect with people. Um, around that and yeah so so many people are so generous with their time too um, yeah and I think I think it's interesting mate because I think like education is something we can do now you could you could have a young coach with you and you could he could be saying bully my guys aren't fit enough how do I get them fitter and you could say hey mate I'll put you in touch with an SNC I know he'll give you some ideas for how you can change your training and, and that could happen and I could have a half hour conversation with him for me that's still coach education because yep. until because I, all I've done is I've, I've given him a bit of knowledge and he's going to have to go and then employ that. Coach development requires experience. Yeah. And people are so keen to say, well, I've got no coach development. I'm like, mate, you've only coached like, you know, five, six, seven. Like coaching takes a really long time to get very good at it. Mm. And coach development requires years in the saddle to actually be able to try all these different things that you learn in your education courses and so I think the people that are like no I want the answers now and I want to be the best coach ever and I want to be and I want that in six months sort of don't it's just not going to happen like you, you need you need to make mistakes you're back now you just froze up there for a little bit mate um yeah no you're right and the, the coaches that I've been talking to that are at that sort of, you know, premier grade rep staff, even professional coaches, um, and you'll probably be the same. The more that we actually learn about what we're doing, the more we actually realise that we don't know. Mm. Um, so, yeah, trying to get that, to, like you said, it's, it's a long process and you're not going to, you're not going to know everything within 12 months, two years, you know, you, you'll coach for 30 years and still be tra- developing as you go. Um, so just hit, that, hit, hit the journey and, and, and let it let develop yourself all the time. hundred percent, mate. And that's a hard thing because then that yeah. breeze into like, as a coach, there's always something I don't know. I could sit down into a presentation from someone and they could absolutely, ba- I, I, I could put up all these numbers on the screen that would confuse rugby coaches I could sit in presentations and they could be talking about the, their tactics and the breakdown or whatever they're doing and they could confuse the hell out of me especially at a grassroots level I think it's important that if you are that um, you know ambitious coach keep what's keep what's important at the front of your mind keep keep the core principles of the game keep it super simple you know the simple answer is nine times out of ten the best especially when um your players are at a grassroots level um, and don't, yeah, ju- ju- just be careful of some of the noise. Like obviously as you get higher, you do need to continue to be innovative, continue to push, but especially for grassroots level, just just keep what's important, keep that at the front of your mind, train what's important and, and, and you'll get better results. And if you, if you get too caught up in some of the other stuff that goes on, I reckon. Yeah, no, you did right, mate. Um, yeah, because I've... Sp- um... I spoke to a guy a while ago and like you said, especially around, like you said, that S and C space, because you guys speak a different language sometimes. And it's just like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, you know, I've got a, you know, syndesmosis and all, and you just go, what, tell me what it is in plain language. Mm. And then I'll remember that that's what that is down the track and, you know, not, not getting overwhelmed either with, oh shit, I don't actually know what this guy's talking about because he's using, you know, medical terms and, jargon that i've never heard before just just ask and just go mate can you just sort of explain what you've just said to me in simple terms you know and it's the same with rugby like you you know like um you know if you're discussing a breakdown with with an attack coach or you know someone that hasn't had much they can get lost in what's going on and just ask people to because if someone actually knows what they're talking about they can simplify it and that's always a good indication for me if I say to someone, oh, I don't quite understand, can you simplify it? And they can't do it. They're just parroting it back to you. that They, they don't actually know what it means. Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, like, 100%, mate. And so like a good example of that is this year, we looked at our ball and play time for, yep. for our, for our um, competition. And we've gone, we've got all these ball and play times, but what, what does that matter? Why, why am I telling a coach 
what the ball in play times are. Well, okay, so on Thursdays, we're looking at things where we're thinking that we need potentially um, a little bit more um, intensity into our training, potentially a little bit less volume. Right, so if the average ball in play time is 35 seconds, on the Thursday training session, our aim is to do the average at an intensity greater than the game. Okay, so we're going to be playing for that 35 seconds of a time. That's three, four phases. That's done quickly. That's aggressive play and then rest, aggressive and then rest. And that's our Thursday. So that's our game day minus two. And then the other instance is, well, what's our worst case during the game? So occasionally we get up to two and a half, three minute blocks of play. Right, well, on our Tuesday, we actually want more volume. That's when we're going for our volume in our training. So on our Tuesday, let's play for that worst case scenario for those most demanding passages where we're going to have to push for that two and a half to three minutes. And then a coach then goes, hang on, I actually understand the context of these stats. I understand how they can affect our training. And I understand why you've bothered to do this because it's actually then going to, to, to be put in a bit of context for them in terms of how does this affect our game model? Yeah, no, and that's exactly right, mate. Yeah, where if you just went all scientific on it, you lose half, you probably lose 80% of the room, but now when you explain it like that people go oh yeah i completely understand why we want those figures yeah um no that that's really good mate i, I like it um just one last thing mate um what advice would you give yourself if you could go back in time to when you first started coaching um what advice would you give yourself knowing what you know now yeah my first bit of advice would be to choose your mentors wisely um and, and, and this would be, I think when you have a good mentor, your, your development, and, and this comes back to you get more experience, your development is accelerated better than, than anything else. And at the same point in time, when you have a bad mentor, you can actually learn a fair bit more about yourself and about um, coaching, but it does take you a long time to realize that they're potentially um, barking up the wrong tree. And I think more and more with people having access to social media and there being no filters and things like that, occasionally people can get um, uh, bamboozled by people with seemingly great experience and they're potentially not the best mentor um, and can get sidetracked by that sort of stuff. But when you do have a mentor that is um, going to push you, they're going to challenge you, they're going to teach you, they're invested in your development... I think that personally for me as a coach, when I'm in those scenarios, there's nowhere else I'd rather be because I know I'm getting better. Um, so to try and put myself in those situations. Um, and then my second bit of advice is just continue to take risks. Just take risks every single time because I think humans have a natural bias to um, overemphasize how bad they think the bad could be. And when everything goes wrong, and I've had everything go wrong in coaching roles before, and it's never as bad as you think it's going to be. It'll always work out. You'll be fine, mate. Like, <laughs> keep taking those risks. Everything that you think that might go wrong when you take them, it, 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 you'll work it out. It'll be fine. You, you can deal with it after the fact. And I think mm. that too many people, they don't take on roles or they don't take on... Um, different things because they're worried about what could go wrong oh i'm not ready for this i can't do that i can't do this like mate you, you work it out no one has all the answers like you, you'll be fine take the risk make it work make work your ass off if you if you think you're underqualified and you've been offered something work your ass off to make yourself qualified work your ass off to make sure you do a good job just keep taking the risk and if you get there and you are underqualified and you do a terrible job and it all falls down then so be it like you, like i said earlier you either win or you learn well you learned an awful lot when you fail that hard yeah. so you, you just keep taking the risks love it love it yeah no that you're right sometimes you just got to go yeah i'm gonna do that and then worry about how you're gonna work it out later hundred percent, mate. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good, mate. Mate, really appreciate your time. That's been awesome. Um, just to get a perspective around some of that S&C stuff as well. So um, really, really good. And I think some of the coaches out there will, will get some takeaways, especially around that um, S&C stuff at the grassroots level. So 
thanks very much for your time, mate. Um, and we'll chat again soon. Cheers, Bully. Pleasure, mate. Thanks, buddy. Cheers. Catch you, mate. Oh,